irreducible complexity says that there are some forms of life that simply cannot evolve from simpler forms gradually, slowly, over long periods of time. I've just given you three examples. Well, DNA is another example. DNA is a beautiful example because it is the very basis, it's the blueprint for what's happening in our bodies. And scientists now are recognizing this. And I, I just want to share with you from a very well-known scientist exactly. I want you to hear his words, the scientific words about what this means when we're seeing it. So you know it's not just me, my opinion, my theory. This is where uh, a body of scientific thinking is now going. So here's what the scientist is saying. This is from Dr. Cohen, published in a research paper. It was released in 1984. He's a mathematician uh, and a member of the New York Academy of Science. Quote, he says, at the moment when the DNA-RNA system became understood, he said, the debate between evolution and creation should have come to a screeching halt because the implications of the DNA and the RNA are obvious and clear. So what he's saying is that the moment our technology advanced to the point where we could see what it takes for DNA uh, and its complement, RNA, to work in our bodies, the complexities are so great that the evolutionary theory simply cannot explain those complexities. So he's saying this whole debate should have come to an end. It is obvious, he's saying, as a mathematician, that there is some in intent, perhaps an intelligence, Definitely something is directing this experience, this mechanism that is at the core of our lives. And this harkens back to the very idea of our origin. Who are we? Where did we come from? What is it that combined those two chromosomes to produce our one, chromosome number two, that sets us apart from all other life and makes us unique? So for me, a passion of mine, as I mentioned earlier, has been to look for clues in our most ancient and cherished traditions, to see what those clues may be saying to us, or what do our ancestors know in their time that we're only beginning to discover in ours. And I've always had a very strong sense that if we know where and how to look into our past, that there are insights that have been preserved in some of our most ancient texts and traditions insights that maybe just aren't so well understood today. So I'm going to share with you very quickly, I'm going, to, I'm going to condense 30 years of research into a project that can only happen when we cross the traditional boundaries of science and spirituality. And I was told as a scientist that these two are mutually incompatible. You, you must choose, I was told, the path of science or the path of spirituality, that the two were in fact mutually exclusive. Here's my thinking. We're living in a time of extremes. We owe it to ourselves to draw upon every facet, every source of information possible to give ourselves whatever it is we need and to call whatever it is that exists so that we can weave a new story, honestly answer the questions for ourselves so that we can thrive in our time of extremes so we can end the suffering and move into a new way of living and thinking. And for me, I believe those clues exist in our past as well as in the new discoveries we're talking about now. So here's what that meant for me. I went into one of the oldest and most mysterious spiritual texts that has ever been known to exist. It's called the Sefer Yitzhak. It is a Hebrew text that is so mystical that the rabbis say it is not even something that can be studied by traditional students because the mystery is so deep and so great. It's a relatively short text, only about a thousand lines long, and it's only been translated into English once. And I took that translation and I read through it very, very carefully as a scientist. And what I found is this, the Sefer Yitzhak is essentially a step-by-step -step description as if someone, an observer, were present the day that the universe and humankind were created. An observer describing the process in line after line, 1,000 lines, what it took to get us where we are today. But the text is 3,000 years old. Whoever wrote that text, 3,000 years old, and it may be that whoever wrote it received it from a wisdom that's even older than 3,000 years, whoever it is that put that text together 
they didn't know what we know today. They didn't know about science. They didn't know about the periodic table of elements. So I began to interpret the text through the eyes of a scientist. And when the text began talking about the elements of the earth and of the wind and of the sun, I asked myself, if I were writing this text today, are those the words that I would use? And my answer was probably not. As a scientist, when I talk about the sun, rather than calling it the sun, I would refer to the most dominant element in the sun, which is hydrogen. When I talk about the air, the wind, I would refer to the most dominant element, uh, which is oxygen. And I began to look at these overlaps. Well, there's another great mystery when it comes to the languages of our past. Scientists know this, linguists know this very well. Every language, every single alphabet that has ever been known to exist, bar none, cuneiform, Arabic, Hebrew, Sanskrit, every Greek, every alphabet that's ever been created has always had a mysterious number linked to the letter that it represents. No one knows for sure where those numbers came from. The numbers never change. They are a constant. So the numbers that are linked to the letters of ancient alphabets, they allow us to think of those alphabets mathematically. So here's what I did as a scientist. I compared the ancient text 3,000 years old and the elements that it describes that make us with the elements of the periodic table, the ancient elements of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon, we find in the periodic table as the letters and they have numbers associated with them. And the numbers that I linked from those ancient alphabets, as I looked at the atomic mass and the atomic weight of our elements, lo and behold, they are the same, they overlap. The atomic mass of hydrogen links precisely with very specific letters in ancient Hebrew, Arabic, and Sanskrit. Uh, the atomic mass for oxygen links precisely with letters in those ancient alphabets. So here's what I did. I replaced the letters in the ancient text with the elements of the periodic table. And when I did that and applied it to DNA, because DNA is made of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon in different combinations. When I took the ancient alphabets and I replaced the elements of the DNA with those alphabets, the DNA began to read as you read letters in a sentence in the page upon a book. Our DNA holds a message that can only be read by crossing the traditional boundaries of science and spirituality. And it helps us one more piece with this clue of our origin. Because the very first sentence, the very first line of every strand of every human DNA says exactly the same thing. And here's what it says. When we replace those letters with a periodic table and we begin reading the text, the very first sentence in every strand of DNA literally says the words, God eternal within the body. God eternal within the body. It doesn't say who God is, how that got there, or why it's there. I'm just sharing with you what happens when we marry science and spirituality. So that gives us one more insight. And now that we know that the DNA that makes us who we are appears to me more than a random process of biology, the question now is what does it mean to have that kind of DNA? What do we do with it? How do we awaken the extraordinary abilities that that DNA, that fusion gives to us in our lives and gives another form of life?